freedom to dare and to dream is certainly supported by the wonderful soul who will be sharing with us ideas in this message. As Robert Michael record, among his very many wonderful gifts, takes us very often on journeys of dreaming through his poetry and his writings, as well as his loving critiques of writings. So I have great pleasure in welcoming Reverend Michael to the podium. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good morning, friends. Good morning. No, not sure about the loving critiques. The, the recipients of the critic, criticism don't like them so much. Welcome to this service in sunny, beautiful Kingston, Jamaica, and specifically to my talk from the beautiful Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. You here in the church can see the beauty. You listening to me online will have to imagine it. Think pale blue skies a golden glow in the atmosphere, one of the sun's gifts. Another is the heat. Think red, white, orange, and purple flowers. Think brownish grass, <laughs> because there's a drought on. And in Kingston, we're getting water only every other day. That, unfortunately, has forced us to only bathe every other day. <laughs> How quickly we have adopted, right? No? Oh, just some of us over the side. No. We can't let the whole world know our business. All right, all right. Moving right along. This morning, I'd like to explain our teaching, the science of mind, really simply. I hope you don't mind. But why would anyone mind a simple explanation of sense of mind? Well, some people love poetry, which is essentially verbal expression couched in beautiful language with many levels of meaning. And some people, other people, like complex concepts and big words. The less they understand what you say, the more profound they think the message is. There's a Louise Bennett poem addressing that. Talk so sweet, it may have the juice we understand. Now, please don't think that in general I have anything against poetic language or big words. They have their place. Let me give you a couple of examples. Here's a bit of poetry that I just love from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 1. Valerie, could I have some soothing poetry music, please? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Thank you, Valerie. Beautiful poetry, yes, straight from the Bible. But what does it mean? If you check online, you'll find that for centuries, scholars have disagreed about the meaning, not of the whole passage, that's one thing, but about the meaning of the word, word. Listen to this scholar, David Reed. The text of John 1, 1, has a sordid past and a myriad of interpretations. With the Greek language alone, we can create empathic, orthodox, creed-like statements, or 
we can commit pure and unadulterated heresy. From the point of view of er the early church history, heresy develops when there's a misunderstanding between concerning the Greek articles, the predicate, nominative, and grammatical word order. So the heresy here is merely a misunderstanding. The early church heresy of Sibelism understood John 1, 1 to read, and the word was the God. As we know it, it's the word was God. The early church heresy of Arianism, another sect, understood it to read, and the word was a God. A third translation is, I quote, and as God was, the word was, unquote. Meaning, whatever you can say about God, example, God is good, God is peace, God is love, etc. That you can say about the word. And in religious science, we generally interpret word as thought or consciousness. Thus we have, in the beginning was consciousness, and without consciousness was not anything made that was made, etc. So it's, it can be quite complex poetry. I also said that some people love complexity. And here are some complex concepts. They come from none other than the founder of this movement, Dr. Ernest Holmes, page 46 in his magnum opus, The Science of Mind. I quote, we are surrounded by an infinite possibility. It is goodness, life, law, and reason. In expressing itself through us, it becomes more fully conscious of its own being. Therefore, it wishes to express through us. And as it passes into our being, it automatically becomes the law of our lives. It can pass into expression through us only as we consciously allow it to do so. Therefore, we should have faith in it and its desires and its ability to do for us all that we shall ever need to have done. Since it must pass through our consciousness to operate for us, we need to be conscious that it is doing so. Full stop, unquote. Or this is true, of course. But it could take us, especially the couple of newcomers that we have to the teaching, the rest of the day to understand all the implications of that one paragraph. I have only 15 minutes. So no poetry, no complexity. That's even though we are dealing with a universal, infinite mind called God. What I want to do is to explain the 10 core concepts of sense of mind as identified by Centers for Spiritual Living in Golden, Colorado, our headquarters. Explain it in a way that an eight-year-old can understand. The core concepts were emailed to us virtually as bare, a bare bones list. I have elaborated on them simply for today. On another day, I'll be complicated. <laughs> concept one, the concept of oneness. God is the source of all that is, and God is all that is. To put it another way, there is nothing but God. That means everything in the universe is made of the same God substance or energy. Think of a large doll's house, about so high, with its contents made of cardboard. The house itself looks different from the chairs in it, and they look different from the beds, which look different from the stove, and so on. So too, the contents of this world, the people, the animals, trees, rivers, oceans, etc., all look different from one another. Each is superficially unique. We humans, too, are unique individualized expressions of God while being at the same time made of the same God energy. 
That's why we can say God is all there is. Concept two, God's triune or threefold nature. God expresses in three aspects, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit is, in a word, consciousness. It is self-knowing and it has a will to act. Soul now is an unself-conscious force which acts as directed and according to law. Body, the third aspect, is form, conditions, results, that, what we see around us. This is how it works. Form is created when spirit desires a particular thing and directs soul, the force, to make the thing desired. The force has to do as directed, robotically. It has no will of its own. There's an addendum to that. The addendum is that God, having a triune nature, is the same as ourselves, human beings, having a triune nature. God is in the macrocosm what we are in the microcosm. Concept three, God's creative nature. When God thinks, things are created. One thing God created was the universe. In the beginning, according to the Bible, God created heaven and earth. And people throughout the ages, all over the world, have always known that God created the universe. That is reflected in the creation stories of all the races. Likewise, all human accomplishments originate in thought. A simple example, I consciously want to raise my hand. My consciousness gives directions to the subconscious, which controls the various nerves and muscles. And voila, my hand lifts. Building a house, even the cardboard house we spoke about, is more complex than just lifting my hand, but the principle, consciousness gives directions and it is created. The principle is the same. Our thought creates our conditions. Our human thinking process is the divine creative process, as I said, in microcosm. That is a smaller version of the divine process. Concept four. Prayer has power. Now all good is eternally available and ready to flow into human experience. How come? Because God, which is another way of saying infinite goodness, is always around, always. And prayer is what attracts the flow in a really focused way in our direction. Affirmative prayer or spiritual mind treatment increases our conscious awareness of the good around us and automatically into our lives it flows. The reason our prayer is so powerful is that our minds are, parts of, are part, a part of God's mind, the one powerful mind which created the entire universe. We are part of that, one mind. Concept five, God, God's wholeness. Spirit is a transcendent, perfect whole that contains and embraces, this is important, all seeming opposites. Now, if I told a mother who had just suffered the loss of a child in a traffic accident, say, and this happens daily around the world, nothing unusual, that there is nothing but God, Unless she was like Job, she would conclude that I was saying that God was in the accident. That's logic. It would probably be impossible then and there to persuade her that God is good. But if one or both of these things happened, she could be so persuaded. If time passes and something wonderful comes out of the death of the child, or 
if she comes to sense of men classes here at the temple and begins to look at life and death and our relationship with God differently, then she could be persuaded. As human beings, we have free will and can, with training, choose what we experience. Shelley and Fraser and Usain Bolt can do what they do because of training. As they train their bodies, we have to train our consciousness. Perfect control do just come so. The same principle that brings us freedom, prosperity, and joy also allows us to experience bondage, lack, or misery according to our use of God energy. You can use it for bad, or you can use it for good. Concept six, God's abundance. Now it's evident as you look around that abundance is a fact of the universe. There are trillions of plants and animals. The rocks and stones and sand seem numberless. The stars go on and on and so on. And of course, we are part of the universe, so we are part of the abundance. As we have agreed, it's all God. We have access to the abundance of the universe physically, of course. We can pick a flower. We can bathe in the ocean. But more importantly, we can access the abundance mentally because our consciousness is part of God's consciousness. We have agreed on that. All that anyone will ever need or desire is being provided by universal abundance. This applies to everybody, not just some people. So why are so many people, perhaps most people, poor? There's a puzzle for you. There's a conundrum. Why? Because they do not know what you know. What I'm telling you now, they just don't know it. Metaphorically speaking, they are going to the ocean of abundance with a cup instead of a tanker. And they get what their container can hold. I'm referring, when I say container, I'm referring to their consciousness, of course. You get from universal substance just what your consciousness can hold. So what you want to do, of course, is expand your consciousness. Concept seven, the reciprocal universe. For every visible form, there is an invisible counterpart. That means what we receive corresponds to what we believe we can receive. There is a law of mental equivalence. As your mind is, so is your conditions. The conditions we individually live in are reflections of our consciousness. It's like a mirror reflects what is in front of it. Our consciousness is the equivalent of what's in front of the mirror. And the world around us is the equivalent of what's reflected in the mirror. If you want to change what's reflected in the mirror, your conditions, change what you put in front of it, your consciousness. That change your consciousness. As Dr. Holmes says, change your consciousness, change your life. Another important aspect of the reciprocal universe is the golden rule. What we do to others will be done to us. The law of cause and effect is at work here. But don't believe that because you are kind to John and unkind to Jane, John will be kind to you and Jane will be unkind in return. You see, sometimes the kindness or the unkindness comes from another part of the universe. But it must come. There's a law. Concept eight. Forgiveness. God is outside of time and lives in the eternal now. In this place, there can be no space for divine anger, unforgiveness, or punishment. If we perceive a need for forgiveness from God for something we have done, 
This is a human condition. It is not as Orthodox Christianity, for example, says, that God will forgive you if you ask. What it is is that God would not punish you even if you did not ask. God does not punish, which is not to say you won't suffer if you do wrong. As we have seen already, the universe is reciprocal. What you sow is what you reap. Now, when you forgive someone for some wrong you felt the person did, you become godlike. Jesus said you should forgive your brother of, of whatever wrong 70 times 7. That's one way of saying forever. Forgiveness frees us to live in God's eternal now. It is the essential step before real spiritual growth can flourish. And science of mind teaches that the ultimate goal of life is complete emancipation from all discord of every nature, and that this goal is sure to be attained by all, and forgiveness of others helps you to reach that goal. Concept nine. Immortality. The truth about life is that life never ends. What we call death is simply the changing of one form of life for another. Death, the belief and perception that life must come to an end, is a human concept. In birth, the invisible becomes visible in the baby, and in dying, the visible again becomes invisible. Life continues on another plane when the body has outlived its usefulness, but life continues. Concept, concept 10, the Christ. Christ is not a person. It is a principle. It refers to us being sons and daughters of God. Jesus Christ means Jesus, the Son of God. Mary Christ means Mary, the daughter of God. The universal image of God that is present in all creation could be called the cosmic Christ, which is present in every person. Let's go back to that doll's house and contents made of cardboard. The essence of the cardboard stuff that is in the house, the table, the chairs, it's the bed, the stove, etc. That essence is the equivalent of the Christ essence in each individual. But though we are all made of God's substance, some of us don't know it consciously. And science of mind teaches that we must know and believe we are God's stuff in order to consistently receive God's blessings. I'm stressing the word consistently here. For your subconscious positive beliefs will bring you some blessings, but haphazardly. Jesus of Nazareth was a human individual who revealed the Christ nature to a really high degree. And he himself said that we can learn to do what he did. And we can do even greater things. It just takes the right training, like Shelley Ann and Usain Get. Now, where can you find some good trainers? Why? Right here at the Temple of Light, of course. Here endeth this training session. Namaste.